Good afternoon. I'm Charlie Smith, the Executive Director of VSIG, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Earlier this year, ambitious goals were established at the federal level, including a plan for 100% clean electricity by 2035 and net zero emissions across the economy by 2050. Reaching these goals efficiently will require action on a transformative scale, doubling or tripling the size and scale of the nation's existing transmission system. Proactive national transmission planning is critical to meeting the current goals quickly, affordably, and reliably. During five separate sessions in late 2020, ESIG convened a broad range of power systems experts who reviewed and synthesized the key research studies investigating energy sector decarbonization and develop the conceptual design for reaching America's clean energy goals using proactive transmission planning and development. This resulted in a transmission white paper released last week and available on the eSIG website. During this webinar, the facilitators of those sessions and authors of the white paper will discuss the findings and conclusions from this work. I'd like to introduce Debbie Liu, who will serve as session chair. Debbie recently joined eSIG as associate director she worked closely with Aaron Bloom, the System Planning Working Group Chair, on the transmission workshop. Before that, she spent many years at NREL working on wind and solar integration studies. She then served as a consultant with GE for a few years and was on her own for a while. I've worked with Debbie for a long time, and I'm very happy to have her here with us at ESIG. Debbie, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, Charlie. Um, so Aaron Bloom of Nexera, who chairs the System Planning Working Group and who led this effort, and I are first going to give an overview of the special sessions and the resulting report. And then after the overview, we're going to have additional comments and questions and answers from uh, most of the facilitators of the sessions. So we brought out the heavy hitters today. We're really happy to have Lauren Azar, who was a commissioner at Wisconsin and an advisor to DOE Secretary Chu and ran the ice pick work in Eastern Interconnection. We have Nick Miller, who spent three eighths of a century on grid studies at GE Energy Consulting. We have Allison Silverstein from the Texas UC and FERC and from her great work with DOE. And we have Bob Zavadil, who is Vice President of Veteranix. So if you have any questions for any of us or general questions about the topic, please go to slido.com and use the code ESIG23. You can also vote questions up if you agree with those questions and want to hear them heard. Um, all right, there we go. So, as Charlie mentioned, at the end of last year, we held five special sessions on transmission for 100% clean electricity with over 50 electricity experts, including folks from Europe. And we invited the folks who ran the big clean energy studies to come and present their work. And we interrogated them. And then we ran breakout sessions to synthesize those studies. And we developed a set of recommendations and a macro grid proposal and you can read about the report at this link. So the question that we want to answer is, how can we get to 100% clean electricity while maintaining affordability and reliability? And you all know there's numerous state city utility goals um, for 100%. And of course, Biden's goals of 100% clean electricity of 2035 and 100% clean energy by 2050 are even more aggressive than a lot of the, the other goals that are out there. We're focusing here on 100% clean electricity by 2035. And today we're gonna to talk about why we think transmission is essential to meeting those goals. Now, can you get to 100% clean without these transmission recommendations? Well, you can technically do a lot of things, but it may not be anywhere as fast or as cheap. So in this report, we find that transmission can enable rapid, affordable decarbonization. So let's put the goals into perspective. The huge strides that we've made over the last two decades, say in, in the last, um, from 20, 2001 to 2019, 
in installing 200 gigawatts of wind and solar have only brought us from 28% clean electricity to 38% clean electricity. You can see we really need to step up our pace by an order of magnitude to get to 100% by 2035. And actually the problem is even harder than what I just showed, because as we clean up electricity, total electricity demand is going to increase as we electrify transportation, buildings, industry. And here I'm defining demand, total demand, as whatever is connected to the grid. So it includes that served by behind the meter, distributed rooftop solar or other generation resources. Now, a number of studies shown here on the left show demand growing by various amounts depending on how fast we do that electrification. So today, electricity consumption is on the order of 4,000 terawatt hours depending on how much electrification happens and how fast that happens demand could double or more by 2050. And if we project that kind of increase in demand out as shown here on the right, you can see it makes the race to 100% clean electricity even more challenging. So we find that this requires tremendous amounts of new clean generation resources. Now today, the cheapest generation resources and the ones with the cheapest projections are wind and PV. And studies are finding that new wind and PV capacity needed is likely on the order of one terawatt or more to reach 100% clean electricity goals and could be twice that to reach 100% clean energy. So just as an example over here on the right, this is from Vibrant Clean Energy Zero by 50 study. And it's showing that when you get out here to 2050 to fully decarbonize the energy economy, across the US, uh, it requires a terawatt of wind and a terawatt of utility scale and distributed solar. Um, down here on the bottom right from the MISO RIA study, which only looks at the Eastern interconnection, they look at building 100% clean electricity scenarios. And they find um, that it takes about a terawatt of wind and PV just to reach the 100% clean electricity. So this is without the massive electrification. Now we evaluated a lot of studies and there have been, there have been tons of studies that have been done. You can see a, a really long list of studies in the um, appendix of our report. They have different assumptions, they have different methodologies. The resources they build out varies, the questions they're trying to answer varies. And we synthesize these to try to understand what role does transmission play in helping them to meet their clean energy goals? What are common findings across the studies? What are common transmission elements across these studies? And we find that a network of cross-country transmission is critical to minimizing cost. So we call this network of cross-country transmission a macro grid. And we define a macro grid as being both DC and AC transmission. We find that a macro grid saves money. And we find that a macro grid saves even more money if you're trying to decarbonize. You save even more. Uh, so the first study um, that I want to mention is the NREL's interconnection seam study that Aaron Bloom led when he was at NREL. It looked at what's the value of interconnecting the Eastern and Western interconnections, right? So connecting across that seam. And um, the design of the HDDC macro grid that um, they study, one of the designs is shown here in the top right. And I should add that when you do these kinds of studies, you don't just give the model the US transmission network and say optimize across all of this because that would be too computationally complex. Instead, what you do is you seed it with, I've got hubs here and I've got hubs here and I want the model to optimize for least cost resource and transmission planning where transmission um, can be built along these different paths. And what they found was that by putting um, additional transmission across the seam and allowed you to build solar in the west, wind in the east, and share. And in the 50% renewables case, um, which is shown here on the bottom right 
there's a table describing um, the statistics from that. The macro grid adds a little bit to transmission infrastructure costs and in getting to 50% renewables, but it saves a lot in generation capacity and O&M costs and in emissions costs. And it results in benefits that are 2.5 times the costs. And these benefits get even better if you look at high renewables. So in an 85% renewables case, and when you add in the nuclear, that's 95% clean electricity, benefits are three times the cost. So it gets, it makes even more sense when you go to high renewables. And in that case, this macro grid was building 40 gigawatts of transfers across the Eastern and Western interconnection. Another study we looked at was Vibrant Clean Energy Zero by 50 study. This study optimizes resource and transmission expansion to decarbonize the whole energy economy. So it includes massive electrification of trans transportation and buildings, and industry. Um, it models a large number of different alternatives, including distributed energy resources, small modular nuclear reactors, carbon capture and sequestration, hydrogen, uh, the macro grid that they built out in that study, the least cost um, um, uh, build out is shown here in the bottom right. And the total megawatt miles that they found to reach this 100% clean energy by 2050 ends up being about um, twice as much megawatt miles as we have today. So you're essentially going to triple the size of our transmission network with this plan. And it finds that if you don't build this macro grid, it costs an additional $1 trillion to get to 100% clean energy goals by 2050. Another study we looked at was the MIT study um, that came out uh, a couple months ago. And that specifically focused in on transmission coordination and expansion on different size scales. So if you do it within a state, um, within a region, across regions, and across the whole US. And they looked at that value. And they found that the bigger you get, the more money you save. Um, the every state for itself approach costs twice as much as the national level optimization and plan. Uh, also, their national approach, when they build out their macro grid, um, it doubles the amount of transmission capacity in megawatt miles that we have today. And they found 40 gigawatts of transfers, which is remarkably similar to the same study uh, across the East and Western interconnection. And they found 70 gigawatts of transfers out of Texas, um, connecting Texas in the Eastern interconnection. And then there are additional studies. I just wanted to mention this one other that looked at offshore wind, because offshore wind is um, one area that often doesn't get studied as much. Um, and Brattle and Barrick have looked at, um, for New England and New York, the difference between doing a proactive planned approach in transmission expansion to connect offshore wind versus doing the, the typical one-off interconnect this generator, interconnect the next generator approach. And they find that if you do a proactive planned approach, so they're looking at let's proactively plan for nine gigawatts of offshore wind in New England, nine gigawatts of offshore wind in New, New York, they would save a billion dollars compared to doing the one-off Gen High approach and half a billion dollars in New York. Now, transmission is not just about delivering resources to load. So it has a host of other benefits and sometimes these don't get studied as much. Transmission contributes to resource adequacy. So on the left here, this is from the Eastern Wind Integration and Transmission Study that Bob Zavadil here um, led 10 years ago. And what this looks at here is um, these dark uh, parts of, of these, these bars are showing for different wind scenarios, 
uh, the capacity value or the effective load carrying capability or the contribution to resource adequacy of wind in these different scenarios for different years. And this top lightly shaded part of these bars is showing the contribution to resource adequacy of the transmission overlay. So they had to build out transmission to connect the wind, deliver that to load. That transmission not only does that job, but also provided this added benefit of contributing to resource adequacy by, you know, five to 10 to, you know, 13 percentage points of capacity value. And then on the right, this is showing SPP, Southwest Power Pool. And in the Southwest Power Pool, this is just borne out from reality, um, their capacity planning reserve margin used to be 17.6%, went down to 13.6% and is now 12% today. Why did it go down? It went down because they expanded their footprint and they built out transmission to better connect in different areas of their region to get at wind diversity, to get at load diversity, to get at the diversity of all of the resources in their footprint. And that transmission smooths out the different profiles. It smooths out all different time scales of weather variability. They save $90 million a year by not building new capacity that they would have otherwise had to build. We also um, looked at transmission contributions to resilience with challenging weather events. So this is a study that's not yet been finalized um, from NREL that looks at challenging weather events. And in a a future with high wind and high solar, it's not so much the extreme heat and the extreme cold that give you the challenging conditions because they find in the study that in the extreme heat and the extreme cold, there typically is good, reasonable wind and solar resource. Rather, it's these more benign, boring conditions like this multiple day in a row, cold wave, in February 2008, that they find to be challenging. And this is just showing you the decrease in wind capacity factor across large swaths of the US um, during this multiple day mild cold wave. And it's these kinds of events that they'll drive your interchanges, they'll alter your dispatch patterns across the country. Um, one of the studies that I want to um, talk about for the next few slides is the MISO-RIA study. And the MISO-RIA study is the most comprehensive study to date in terms of all of the different aspects of reliability that they examined. So most studies look at resource and transmission expansion, and they do an optimization for that. And many studies run production cost model, and they do system balancing hour to hour, make sure that you can get through and your, your ramps. Um, this study also looked at resource adequacy. So can you meet your one day and 10 year metric? Um, and it also looked at stability, steady state and dynamic. And um, this study is a little bit different than the others in that what they did was they um, increased annual wind and PV penetration by 10% increments. And at each 10%, they find all the reliability problems from these different studies. They fix them with the least cost commercially available solutions, and then they go to the next step. So transmission we find was needed to help system balancing in the study. So they run a production cost model and they find that 10, 20, 30% to make that system work, they needed to overbuild renewables a little bit. Starting at 40% though, they needed new transmission and the gray here is AC and the orange here is DC. They need a new transmission to help hour to hour system balancing. And these um, bars here are incremental. So by the time you get up to 50%, you not only got to build the 50%, but you had to get there. So you had to build what's here in the 40%, the 30, the 20, the 10%. So these all add up. Um, one of the things they noted is that transmissions needed to deliver ancillary services. So for example, if you've got a lot of solar and you've got a duck curve and you need to make sure that you have 30 minute ramping capability, 
Um, this shows their, their worst case situation, um, how much ramping capability they had, but how much deliverability they had of that ramping capability. And some of that deliverability was questionable and they needed to build more transmission to deliver that ancillary service. They also find that transmission is needed for steady state reliability. So here they're running a load flow model. They're looking for thermal overloads. They're looking for voltage being within limits. They're looking at normal operation. They're doing an N minus one contingency analysis. And they find that um, starting at around 30%, you need to start adding in more transmission to um, manage your thermal overloads and manage your voltage within, within limits. And as you get to the higher penetration levels, you need higher voltage transmission solutions. So you need higher transfer capacity. And then they do a whole bunch of studies in this one um, chart um, because the grid needs to be dynamically stable if there's a transmission fault or you lose your largest generator. And for those of you who might be who might be new to ESIG, um, uh, as we retire and or turn off synchronous generators like coal and gas plants, um, those synchronous generators are providing system strength. And um, wind, PV, and batteries are all inverter-based generators. They require system strength in order to run stably. And um, because of the um, turning off and the retirement of synchronous generators, um, they were running into weak grid issues, starting here at the 40% renewable energy penetration level that was resulting in some small signal oscillations, transient voltage stability, and they had to add in HVDC to help mitigate those problems. Um, in the future, we'll probably have other technologies like grid forming inverters, but um, they were looking only at commercially available solutions. Then when they got to the 50% um, penetration level, they ran into a different kind of issue. Um, the system had low inertia and they were running into frequency response issues and had to install a bunch of synchronous condensers to help mitigate that. So when you add up all the different things that they did, um, and that's what this graphic shows for all the different kinds of aspects of their studies, you'll note that a huge amount of what they do to make this system work at the 50% level is AC transmission, DC transmission, and fax devices, basically um, transmission infrastructure. I mean, there are other little things like a little bit of combined cycle, a little bit of renewables overbuild, but the vast majority of solutions and infrastructure needed was transmission. Okay, so some of you might ask, might be asking yourself, can't we do this with storage? Can't we do this with distributed energy resources? And I'll just go through a couple slides on this. Um, the MISO-RIA study also compared the difference between a transmission-only solution, a storage-only solution, and transmission plus storage solution. And as you would expect, they find that the transmission plus storage solution is the, the optimal least cost solution. Interestingly, a transmission only solution is very close in cost to it. And the storage only solution costs much more. And I'll also add, you know, curtailment was the least in this optimal solution. And then with respect to DERs, DERs are definitely part of the solution. Um, I will note that most of the studies that we looked at only look at the bulk power system. When they consider DERs, they consider them in terms of the trade-off between building, say, rooftop solar versus building utility-scale solar and transmission. So the only study that I know of that optimizes at the distribution interface is a study by Vibrant Clean Energy that came out recently. And what I mean here is that, as you know, as we electrify, we're gonna be increasing loads on the distribution infrastructure. And there's a huge amount of distribution infrastructure out there. And if we trigger the need for upgrades on that large amount of infrastructure, that could cost a lot of money. So managing um, that need for triggering an upgrade at the distribution level 
becomes important to save money. And in this um, study, they optimized uh, across that interface. And they found that when you do that, um, yes, you build more distributed solar, you build more distributed storage, and you reduce the amount of utility scale storage and utility scale solar. You do not eliminate, however, the large amount of utility scale wind and solar and storage that is still needed, or the large amount of transmission that is still needed to make these systems work. And now with that, I'm going to turn it over to Aaron to talk about um, our recommendations that are coming out of the report. Hey everyone, I'm so glad to be here and to see so many different names online um, of, of friends uh, that, that are interested in this. I wanna take one second and talk about a few of the co-facilitators that really helped us out. So John Simonelli showing up to all of our meetings and helping us um, stay honest on the engineering. We had Daniel Olson from Breakthrough Energy, Liza Reed from the Nitsen Center, Panos Motis, from Carnegie Mellon, Chan Zhang, and Aiden Tui from EPRI. They all provided us an awful lot of help um, and we couldn't have done it without all their support. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide and start talking about the recommendations. So we tried to keep it pretty darn simple. Anybody that collaborated with me on this paper knows that I was really beating people over the head with trying to have a short list of recommendations and trying to keep the report reasonably short at under 30 pages. Um, but, but first, we really think that it is important if we're going to navigate um, how we can take the, the, the United States power system from where it is today towards 100% clean electricity, that a national transmission planning authority would, have be, would be of incredible value to helping us um, coordinate that. And that's because there is no clear um, legislative authority or clear operational authority about who should be thinking about where transmission gets built across the country. And so a National Transmission Planning Authority would really help us out on that. And there's two things that we believe the Transmission Planning Authority should do. One is that you clearly identify the renewable energy zones that we anticipate states will be developing at their direction, because that's where their jurisdiction clearly lies, um, in the strongest resource areas. And we're gonna talk about some of those zones and they're very large areas that won't be a surprise to many of you on the phone. And the next thing is, the National Transmission Planning Authority should be working with the regional um, planning authorities and all the other interested parties in designing a national macro grid that's probably going to be comprised of some mixture of HVDC and, and high voltage AC, depending on the situation. And we'll show a design that shows some directional answers about where we think the system could go. So why don't we go ahead and go to the next one. So one of the topics that we discussed at length during ESIG special sessions was whether or not ESIG should be making policy recommendations. And the conclusion was that it would be totally inappropriate for a group of awkward engineers to make value-based decisions that have historically been left to regulators and politicians and policy experts. So you might ask yourself, um, why is ESIG recommending the National Transmission Planning Authority? I think the answer is pretty darn simple. Creating a plan isn't a political action, it's simply good engineering. The US needed a space program to put a man on the moon and the US needs a transmission plan to decarbonize the economy. The plan should be inclusive, comprehensive, and importantly, adaptable as systems and conditions change. And there's an awful lot of regional perspectives that need to be thoroughly considered as we decarbonize the economy so that we can make sure that it happens in an equitable manner. But those are decisions that are needed for, for others in the policy domain. What we really need though is a plan. And the incremental approach that has been used regionally and, and with the existing bodies hasn't delivered a, a, a capability at the national level that allows us to meet national policy goals. And that's not a policy statement, it's a fact. There's no single entity that considers national policy goals in a holistic manner across the country. And we think that there should be one, just like we have for agriculture, transportation, and even space. Let's go to the next slide. So the, the weather is boundless, right? It doesn't care about RTO boundaries, resource adequacy constructs, or whether or not your system is prepared. Weather does what weather do. And the only way to manage drought, famine, and extreme weather is to look to your neighbors and your neighbors' neighbors. There isn't a state in the country that closes its borders to crops from another state during a drought. Extreme weather happens. It's very hard to predict, and despite best laid plans, extreme weather can do things that you'd never imagined before. 
a national transmission planning authority, is the only way to ensure support can be delivered to neighbors when the weather gets rough. And just as we have regional weather offices that support the National Weather Service, regional grid planning should support the national transmission planning. So this is really a partnership of the regions and the nation to try to reach common goals together. Go to the next slide. So the last time I took a trip, I don't know if it's anything like you guys, was, was literally about a year ago today. And I still remember what it's like to get in a line at an airport. There's only two ways to get through a security gate. You either buy priority access or you find an empty security station on the other side of the airport. If you look across the RTOs and regional planning authorities in the United States, you can see queues a mile long. And what we have here is the queue for MISO. They've probably got the best looking um, screen for how you can see everything that's on the queue. But I can assure you, if you're looking in California, the WEC, SPP, PGM, really any region, the number of projects that are looking to interconnect in the grid continues to grow. And it's making a lot of really interesting things happen. The best resource regions in the country where it's the windiest and where it's the sunniest typically tend to be where the transmission system is, is actually not the most robust, not the strongest. It's just an artifact of how we develop the system. And so what's happening is instead of trying to build resources where it blows the most or where the sun shines the brightest, we're building them in, in, in less optimal locations. And, and in many respects, that is the magic of the market that's gonna find the best places and evaluate those trade-offs. But that is a slow incremental approach when you're trying to move oh, from just shy of 200 gigawatts to over a terawatt each of wind and solar. So we need a different approach to unlock what is happening in the regional interconnection queues. And a national transmission planning authority can help solve that problem by identifying regions where the network must be expanded to allow for efficient decarbonization. Let's go to the next one. One of the things that we talked about several times and Bob Zavadil really taught me a lot on this is we don't just need a plan. We need a planning process. The relevant entities need to be assembled biennially, right? That means every other year to analyze system needs, conduct resource adequacy analysis, production costs, stability work, feasibility analyses, all the detailed engineering that they taught all of you in school needs to be applied at a scale that is truly staggering and a scale that most people, most organizations don't have capabilities for. But the United States through the various federal agencies and academic institutions has the models, the data, and the expertise when they work with the regional partnerships to create a national transmission plan that can help us manage a lot of the risks and get a lot of the benefits uh, that Debbie was talking about earlier. And so we need that process to be developed where we conduct these regular ongoing planning activities. It includes comprehensive engineering and analysis. We leverage the capabilities we have and a planning process isn't good enough if all it results in is a design that sits on a shelf. No, in fact, what we need is a plan that results in some construction of transmission and transmission that doesn't just go between two neighbors, but it connects multiple neighbors to one another. We'll go to the next one. Now, ERCOT's competitive renewable energy zones may be one of the most successful transmission planning activities ever conducted. I think a close second is probably the multi-value projects that happen in MISO. But the benefit of these approaches is that they clearly identify the location of the best resources in the state and provide clear guidance to transmission developers and customers on where resources should be developed. And that vision, that clear sight of where we could go, that certainty has a lot of values for the development of the market. A future with 100% clean electricity is going to require carbon-free electricity to be developed basically everywhere. If you can erect a turbine, if you can find enough land for a solar plant, it's probably going to make sense because of the sheer scale of development that we need to do. And I would say the first step that we want to probably go um, start investigating in earnest is looking at all the unpowered hydro dams across the United States and figuring out where are the opportunities to electrify those dams by adding generators to them. The next thing we need to do is be looking at the wind belt here in the central part of the United States and then on the offshore coast to figure out how much capacity can we build in those regions. Solar energy, like I said, it, the sun shines basically everywhere. So wherever you can put a utility scale installation would be wonderful, but there's some truly exceptional resources in the southern parts of the country. And the reason we're showing all the population centers here is because those are going to be central locations of high volumes of distributed energy resources. Getting to 100% clean electricity isn't a big or small decision. 
we need both types of resources to propel us in that direction. And so we really need to fight the urge to try to choose one winning technology over the other. Clearly, they all have something to give, but what we need to have is a market for them to all provide their services when they have them available. So, um, yeah, thank you. The next slide. So uh, there's a couple principles that we came up with when we were trying to design the macro grid. The first one was to connect the regions with diverse generation and load profiles. So we'll look at the differences that each region has and try to join those together. The macro grid should connect regions that have different wind and solar and load regimes, as well as connect renewable energy zones to the load centers when the resource is in great excess of the demand. It also needs to have the smallest cost and footprint possible. Building a copper sheet across the country isn't feasible or desirable. And so what we need to figure out is how can we use existing right of ways, whether that's along existing transmission paths, highways, or maybe even railroad right of ways to try to make sure that we can fit the wires where they're available. There's even some great ideas about how you could take existing AC paths and convert them into HVDC paths should that be um, desirable in each indication. And one of the things I do wanna talk about is, while we do talk an awful lot about HVDC and the benefits it can provide for especially long distance transmission and working between unsynchronized systems, there could be large elements of the macro grid that could be developed in, with AC technology. And it really requires this, this detailed engineering process to go figure out what those opportunities are. So the next thing is we need to take advantage of existing surplus transmission capacity. So future interconnections points must take advantage of existing brownfield sites where there might be transmission capability available, whether that's a retiring plant that we don't think we're gonna need in the future because of its carbon emissions, um, or it's some industrial site that is, is long since retired and has an opportunity to add new resources to it. This is gonna help us reduce the need for greenfield fight sites and help us manage our substation facility upgrades as well. So the, the other detail that I think is really important as we look at the existing system is this new national system that we envision going over the rest of the country needs to be very carefully integrated with the existing and planned AC systems. And because of the size of the macro grid that we're talking about with injection nodes of 10, maybe even 20 gigawatts of capacity, um, it's going to require substantial changes to the underlying AC network to make sure that we can accommodate those types of changes. The other item that is going to be very important is that the network must work tightly integrated, but also be able to separate safely when necessary. So it works better together, but it can still subside on its own. And so you can imagine these set of, of nested networks that can go all the way from macro to micro, um, so that you can manage the disturbances and make sure that the customers are getting the, the load that they need or getting the generation they need. One-off lines aren't gonna cut it. Um, not, they're not gonna cut it because of the size of the challenge of getting to 100%, but also because of the risk of failure. So one of the things you'll see in the design as we go through these couple slides is that we've designed these what we call reliability loops, which are a, a long founded engineering principle that helps us make sure that we have redundancy and reliability in our system so that we can tackle the unexpected. Why don't we go ahead till the next slide. So obviously you can't build a cross country network of thousands of miles of transmission lines all at once. Um, so you need to figure out how you can build it in stages. And just like Eisenhower's federal highway system that was only supposed to take 10 years, but took 62 years, the final design um, looked quite a bit different from the original design that they proposed in 1955 and I've got on the screen. And so you can see a lot of commonalities. You can see I-70 on here. You can see I-75 and, and I-35, uh, I guess, is, is the other one that you can clearly see on here. But the final design was quite a bit different. And, two-lane highways versus four-lane. I mean, in some places we have six. So the design that we're about to show you, we know that it's not going to be the final design, but it is a starting point. And we should start that, um, that development with shovel-ready projects that can be modified to grow. So there's a variety of projects that I'm gonna talk about on the next slide. These are the stage one projects. There's probably several others that you could be investigating. And the National Transmission Authority should take a good hard look at projects that we have out there today see where they're connected from the generation and the load side and determine whether or not it's possible to, oh, you know, build them incrementally, right? So maybe you only start with the three gigawatt capacity that's suggested today, 
But if you build larger towers, you can then add additional conductors to those lines or converter stations as necessary. In the second stage of our proposed plan for the macro grid, you need to start building reliability loops and collector systems, because this is when you really kick it into overdrive with scale. And again, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Stage three is a constant review and update of what has been proposed, how the system has evolved, and what is happening with the pace of electrification. Because pathways that might be, you know, transmission paths of three gigawatts might be fine for getting us towards 100% clean electricity if you build enough of them. As we double or maybe even triple our load with electrification, we're going to have to see a bunch of those expand. We'll go to the next one. So anybody that's visited with me um, or worked with me on a project knows that I like big maps. And uh, I can't lie. If I'm doing a presentation, this is one thing that I can't deny. A map can convey so much information. It gives viewers a sense of space. It shows the connections between where a person is and where they could be. Maps show scale and maps show possibility. This map shows the potential for uniting the country towards a common goal of decarbonization. And whether it's the SEAM study or another great work by Vibrant Clean Energy or the newest design that Dale Osborne sends you at 1.30 in the morning, the National Transmission Planning Authority will need to make a big, beautiful map if it wants to propel the country towards decarbonization so that it can convey the message to others. The map's going to need large lines and it's gonna need a mix of technologies. Perhaps some of them are only gonna be a couple gigawatts in scale, but other ones could set new barriers in technology by, by reaching 10 to maybe even 20 gigawatts. It's going to need to make the best use of the grid we have today and bolster the system we have for a resilient, reliable, and affordable clean energy future. No one at eSIG would ever recommend building out the map exactly as we presented it here, but this map conveys several critical messages about the scale, scope, and general layout of a US macro grid. And I wanna talk about a couple of these things in detail. So you see the stage one lines we have in blue. These are lines that have been proposed today. It's Transwest Express, it's Sunzia, it's Plains and Eastern, it's New England Connect, and we've got a full list of them in our report. There's several other lines that have been discussed over the last decade or so that connect areas of large amounts of resource to large areas of load. And we need to bring those together and we need to start construction soon. So if you look at this design and you squint a little bit, you might see similarities to the SEAM study. You'll probably see similarities to the Vibrant Clean Energy work. And you'll even see things that we learned from Ann Barrick and the Brattle Group for their offshore collector systems. Because while 15 years ago, nobody thought we'd really build a significant amount of offshore wind in the United States. When you look at the projected builds in New England, New York, and the Mid-Atlantic, we're starting to get to the tens of gigawatt scale. And having a system that can both integrate those resources, as well as provide alternative pathways up the Atlantic seaboard could provide significant value. Now there's one big hole in the Ohio River Valley area where you don't see any new lines. And that's because we have a massive amount of AC transmission there. You can see the 765 network in those dark lines that is coming out of, out of the, the Midwest to the East Coast. And those systems are going to need some art to figure out how we try to integrate with them correctly. You're also gonna note the nodes that we have connected to Canada. And there's a lot of opportunity for international collaboration here. Some of you may know that they're actually running their own version of a SEAM study to try to join together the provinces to make it even more efficient to reach their clean energy goals. So this is the starting point of a conversation. This isn't the design that we think everybody should go ahead and build. So let's go to the next one. So next steps, what do we do? Well, the first thing is we really need to start immediately. Uh, I'm planning to retire by 2050 and we need to make a lot of progress if we're gonna meet the decarbonization or net zero energy emissions by 2050. So it is important that we start working together and collaborating immediately. A multi-regional transmission plan is essential as the foundation for developing a clean, reliable and affordable power system. The plan needs to have enough flexibility and functionality to accommodate regional variations in energy resources and diverse resource technology and economics. The next thing we need to do is make it really clear what the decarbonization vision is and convene the major players. Our recommendation, if he asked, was that Joe Biden should bring together the major players and ask them how we can solve this challenge together. 
And we talked quite a bit about that convening. Like, shouldn't it just be, you know, a variety of staff at the DOE and FERC? And I think that there is this real opportunity for national leadership from Congress, from the president to say, here is the common agreed to plan and here are the players that we need help from to bring us these answers. The next item that we need is we need to designate a national transmission planning authority. And there's a variety of ways that we could do that. And quite honestly, there's a bunch of good options that are out there. So whether or not that's creating a new organization, whether that's giving new authorities to FERC, or whether it's tweaking some authorities that we might already have through the National Electric Transmission Congestion Study, as others have suggested, those are all viable options. But we need to get there quickly so that we can start building lines and building the infrastructure that we need in, in an expeditious manner. The next item is we need to leverage the national capabilities and industry expertise because a bunch of government wonks or researchers coming up with a plan is not sufficient to get it built. So we need to bring together a partnership and that's why we think the convening of these organizations is so critically important. And finally, well, it's the money. So everybody's going to talk about cost allocation issues. How are we going to pay for this? How can we get it jump started? What is a down payment that grandma and grandpa can give us for the future generations? Um, this is a serious conversation and we have a good sense of ideas about what needs to be done from an engineering perspective, um, but we, we could really use some more help in terms of managing the funding. And so uh, I've got a couple other items that I wanna hit on before we start going into questions. I think I'm just like two minutes ahead of schedule and I am remiss in forgetting one of my dearest friends that helped us on this, Jay Casperi, who couldn't join us because he was singing the song of transmission at another event right now. But Jay Casperi from Grid Strategies provided a lot of critical insight and patience as we worked on this. If you're interested in digging in more about the challenge of paying for transmission, I got another webinar for you. ESIG is hosting the third in its series of permitting, planning, and paying for transmission. This next one will be held with Steve Gaw, and it's tomorrow at 2 p.m. So please be sure to go to the ESIG website and sign up and, um, and try to hear more of our thoughts about how you can pay for transmission. So my timer said at 1.50, I needed to get ready for the responses from our other panelists. I'm glad to say it's 1.48. So let's go ahead and see the faces of the other panelists and start the conversation. Um, we're gonna start off uh, with Nick Miller, who's gonna be the first one that gets to opine on what he says, because you were the first one to pop up on my screen. And then we'll go to Lauren and we'll go to Bob and hopefully Allison can join us as well. So go ahead, Nick, first response right. is what do you think? Super, thanks, Aaron. Well, let me dig into one specific item that you put on. That's one of my favorite uh, soapboxes and relevant. So that, uh, that map, and you made the point, uh, a big system like that, uh, if anybody's ever gotten off a six lane uh, interstate and crashed into a two lane road that snarled, you understand that, uh, that the supporting infrastructure and the fact that those nodes aren't in every state is only, uh, is only the macro picture. We need to have the processes in place to take advantage of the existing expertise uh, to get that secondary system, which is massive, built, A. And the second nickel is in the US, particularly rural US, we use, a, use our power right of way relatively poorly compared to the rest of, uh, uh, of uh, the, the advanced uh, economic world. And there's a lot of technology, but there's the need for process uh, so that we can pack a lot more power onto the rights of way that we already own. You mentioned uh, also the possibility of using rail and uh, interstate highway. Uh, and I'll give you an example right now in New York State, my backyard, we're retiring uh, a right of way uh, that has 230 kV transmission, and they're going to update the exactly the same right away, and it will carry at least four times the power without having to use any eminent domain. We got to do that. Thanks so much, Nick. Lauren, let's hear you. Outstanding. So thank you, Aaron. A week ago today, BlackRock, the largest asset manager in the world, announced that corporations it invests in have to have design plans and disclose plans for meeting net zero carbon by 2050. Three and a half weeks ago, General Motors announced it's gonna phase out all get, 
gas powered vehicles by 2035. Um, one of the first comments that came up while um, Debbie was speaking was saying, we don't have a technology problem, we have a policy problem. So what policy changes are gonna happen uh, to ensure that the ESIG um, conceptual uh, plan can actually become a reality? And I need to tell you that businesses like BlackRock and GM will push us forward. Um, because one of the critical components of getting a meeting of the minds on policy members is um, to get people to essentially agree on foundational facts. And um, some of the assumptions that we need to make sure we have a meeting of the minds are is number one, that we will have a clean energy, um, clean energy be tw by 2050 and we'll have significant electric by 2050. Once you have those two assumptions, um, a lot of conclusions fall from that, including what was identified from ESIG, namely transformational change in the generation portfolio and the transmission grid. And you know, as a former uh, Wisconsin commissioner, I always have my commissioner hat on. So I wanna make sure that transformational change is gonna happen in a cost effective manner. And gosh, I hope that people are convinced, given the information that, that Debbie and Aaron provided, that indeed providing and building out a microgrid is going to be the most cost-effective way to get this transformational change done. Um, I've been hearing way too much, which is actually getting me nervous, uh, from states and other um, interested parties that they want to only build locally, which can you do it? As Debbie said, yeah, you can do it, but it's going to break the bank. So I do want to talk about the National Transmission Planning Authority. Um, I, you know, whether or not we have the authorities to create that right now, don't know, but there are other ways to get this macro grid built, even if we don't have authorities to create a National Transmission Planning Authority. Would like to concur with what the report said, namely that state commissions have to participate uh, for the purpose of uh, resource adequacy when doing this national planning. But I do wanna put a warning up that parochialism and protectionism could hamper our national planning efforts. Um, I led uh, the Eastern Interconnection States Planning Council, gosh, what year was that, 2010, 2011. And that's, that was the regulators east of the Rockies in the US and Canada. And we met regularly uh, to participate in the first of its kind interconnection-wide planning process. And one of the, one of the le many lessons I learned uh, while leading that, that uh, uh, fantastic group um, was that there was one region um, whose regulators didn't want to import or export any uh, electricity. And they banded together and they were uh, so effective that they actually baked in assumptions into the plan that minimized the amount of regional transmission that was identified during that study. Um, I, I, I wanna say ironically by the, not the end, but the middle of the process, they realized they had made a mistake and came back and wanted to change uh, the assumptions, but the modeling was too far along. But what I wanna say about that, the lesson I got was that, um, you know, parochial interests can indeed skew a planning study, and we need to make sure that a national planning authority will hear and consider local interests, but those interests cannot override the overarching goal of achieving cost-effective transformation of the generation and transmission. And lastly, that each state needs to receive roughly commensurate benefits from any plan that comes out. Over, Aaron, back to you. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Lauren. And now, uh, Bob Zavadil, uh, let's let's hear your comments on, on, on the process and what we've done so far. Hey, <clears throat> thanks, Aaron. So since this process started, I've been in my mind working the head in the book a little bit, you know, really just thinking about sort of the, um, the shape and form of what it would take to do the national transmission planning. So the one thing we know is technically, and even economically with regard to some level of detail, we know how to do this. The RTO transmission expansion planning processes have evolved over the last uh, 10, 15 plus years uh, to very well accommodate the uh, unconventional attributes of renewables relative to what we were used to uh, historically. 
Um, we've even taken those processes uh, up to higher level, extra, extra RTO. Uh, Lauren had mentioned ice pick, the companion activity there with EIPC, um, as well as in the other interconnection that looked at an interconnection wide view. Um, Aaron talked about the steam study before, as well as the more recent study by MISO, where uh, we gained some altitude and, and took kind of a top to bottom look a little bit. Um, and that's compared to what we do currently in the RTOs, which is much more incremental and um, sort of within the boundary. That's what's happened uh, since the first orders that uh, initiated these kinds of activities. So with regard to National Transmission Planning Authority or whatever it would be called, there's a couple of things that keep coming up in my mind is that one, it has to be continuous, right? EIPC, Steam study, the MISO study, they were kind of one-off things. And then they sit, they bring a lot of information to the table, uh, but after a decade or so, it gets a little stale. Um, so this process needs to be ongoing. Well, how fast? Well, we, we have like two year cycles in the RTOs for their transmission expansion planning. And I would see this national view as a top down versus the bottom up from the RTOs. So that means the cycles have to be synchronized somehow. Um, that's a big challenge, right? Because now we're talking two years versus maybe N years for some of the other studies, uh, you know, given what all needs to be done. Now, one advantage I see is that this top down view, unlike EIPC, where they were dozens of futures that were created by the stakeholder group. Uh, we're maybe looking at just a couple here. We're looking at 100% clean energy. Maybe one bookend is decarbonization. Maybe the other bookend is a 10 year out view of where we stand at that time with regard to renewables. Case in point, what's happening in the Northeast with regard to offshore? How much is, of that is built? And so we can potentially streamline the work of this group by having that sharp focus on sort of the endpoints, as opposed to branching out business as usual and high renewables, low renewables, and, and those sorts of things. We have the tools, we have the models, um, we have the data, we have the renewable resource data that makes this possible. We have the computing power at the national labs to run um, <clears throat> national scale production models at hourly and higher resolution. Um, so it's right there in front of us and how we formulate this, I don't know. <laughs> but we have to start because this is the first step along this path toward uh, something that from this presentation, uh, we pretty clearly need to reach those goals. Thanks, Aaron. Awesome. Uh, so thank you so much for, for those comments uh, from the group. I'm not sure if Allison has made it back online. So we're going to go ahead and go um, to our next topic of discussion. And we're seeing some of these. We're going to try to keep it a little short, but we did see some comments in the, in the Slido about ERCOT. And it wouldn't be an electricity event if we didn't talk about ERCOT at least a little bit. Now, uh, we don't need to go into all the nasty details of what happened there and, and how this may or may not have helped solve the problems, but we can probably go into some ideas and thoughts. Um, so, Warren, uh, why don't you kick us off on a couple of thoughts about what role a National Transmission Planning Authority could have had in, in, in managing events or, or what you learned from the special sessions that would have been um, applicable to the, to the recent history? Um, thanks, Aaron. And let me just say, and we're focusing on ERCOT or not? Yeah, we're just focusing on ERCOT right okay. now. Okay, um, so but, here's... So we're going to jump into other discussion topics in a little bit. It's got, got it. As a, um, again, as a former regulator, my takeaway was that transmission is needed to ensure resilience and optionality. Um, the, um, the, the fact that Texas was isolated, we also had uh, constraints in the MISO South area is my understanding that uh, led to some of the problems in that area. Um, we do unfortunately have some utilities that would prefer not to build transmission uh, because they prefer um, to run their own generators rather than import electricity. 
that's also an issue and that gets to the protectionism I was discussing before. Bottom line is we need more regional and interregional lines um, and lines that connect into different weathering systems. What we, what we saw was PJM was sending electricity. They weren't having a polar vortex into MISO and MISO was sending it over to SPP. Uh, could we have done a lot more and a lot better? Absolutely. And do we need to? Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron. Over. Okay, Nick, let's hear from you. Yeah, so without digging into what happened, and frankly, uh, you know, the jury's still out. Uh, I, on the technology side, uh, these extreme events, and, and I'm not going to talk about the, the uh, you know, whether Texas should have been interconnected to the rest. Uh, there's, that's a, di a discussion for others. But the fact that the transmission as well as generation is vulnerable to these extremes of weather uh, is something that needs a, a better handle. And on the upside, this is something I didn't say earlier, is that, is that uh, grid enhancing technologies and put all these great things in one bucket of ways to, uh, to uh, push the power in the right direction, take advantage of the fact that the conductors are very cold and might actually be able to be overloaded. Uh, uh, and, and rapidly reconfigure systems that are taken out by ice. There's a whole bunch of room for resilience to be added by adding brains and discrete hardware to the transmission system. And the economic and engineering practice to figure out what would help when we're on the ropes, so to speak, is, uh, is not part of our process and needs to be. Awesome. Okay, Bob, let's let's hear comments from you before we go back to Allison, who I'm glad to see her back online here. <laughs> well, this is a very there. quick one. I think uh, Debbie Liu, kind of at the top of the presentation, um, made a very salient point with regard to this, that in these times of trouble, maybe it's not your neighbors, but it's your neighbor's neighbors that are the ones that are going to help you out. And so simply bolstering connections with someone that is potentially in the same situation you're in, um, maybe won't do it. So that sort of points to the large scale view that we're trying to take here. Great. So Allison, our resident Texan, uh, go ahead and, 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 and open up for us a little bit. Hi, y'all. I, I want to applaud and uh, as affiliate with, as the formal saying goes, with everything that's been said so far by everybody today in this webinar. With respect to Texas, it is um, welcome back. I'm, I'm happy to be rejoining all of the ranks of those of you who enjoy daily hot showers. It was a long week. Um, and, and for that reason, I want to say that most Texans who were stuck in the cold in the dark think that it would be a pretty good idea to have interconnection with other areas. It would not have completely solved the problems that, that we face, but it sure would have made it easier for grid operators and for uh, us Texans to be who were affected to think that this could be resolved faster. And I think um, there will be many discussions about regulation and market design and lots and jurisdiction, but I have to tell you that most of the people who are sitting in the dark don't give a rat's ass about who's in charge. They just want something that works better. So with that inelegant phrasing, I'll turn it back to you, Aaron. Oh, uh, you know, I just feel so lucky that I got to work with all these legends of the transmission system and planning. And um, if you guys haven't had a chance to work with one of them in the past, uh, I highly encourage you to take the opportunity if it presents itself to you. So right now we're going to go into two other discussion topics. We're going to have one 10 minute session talking about the technology, and I'm going to feed in a couple of the questions that we have on Slido because we've got some great technical questions there. And then at about 0220 central time, we're going to switch over to a policy discussion um, to kind of wrap it up. Then there's one other thing I want to let you know about. Don't hang up yet. We are going to have an extra 10 minutes where you can kind of walk up to the podium, unmute yourself, and go into one of the breakout rooms and ask us questions to drive, to give a, a little bit more personal feel to the event like we used to have in person. So why don't we go over and, and start talking about the technology challenges associated um, with building a macro grid. And I'm going to start with our top ranked question from the wonderful Ella Zhao. How would you, and this question's for you, Bob, 
and you, Nick, as well, and maybe Debbie can chime in. How would you prioritize building new interregional transmission versus upgrading existing mostly intra-regional transmission that is potentially old and outdated? Well, dang, I would just assume not have to have make that an either or uh, <laughs> decision. And uh, I'll leave it to the policy folks to, uh, to tell me why I can't have both going on at the same time. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's fight the fights that we can't. So I'm of the opinion that the better use of existing right away is in some regards uh, low hanging fruit. Um, and, and we ought to be moving there quickly. Every new bit, you know, same highway thing, right? You know, you fix a section of highway, it doesn't fix everything. The congestion goes to the new intersection where the, where the bridge went off in the space and didn't get finished. But, you know, doggone it, that doesn't mean you don't build it. It means that you get on to the next. So, you know, let's go for the places that give us the best bang uh, and that are practically realizable. Awesome. Bob, do you have any other comments to add about that trade-off and if it has to be a trade-off? Well, I, yeah, I, I agree with Nick on that point for sure. And I would um, point out that you know, inter-regional transmission is something that we've you know, ostensibly, ostensibly been looking at um, for the last 10 years. We've just not made very much progress. So that's really part and parcel of the the current processes we have. Um, with regard to the national view, uh, if we talk about 100% clean energy, we're going to be starting out with, with a, lot of, a lot of megawatt hours that needs to be moved long distances. So it may be more than interregional right off the bat. Awesome. So the, the next question we have, another technical question, very highly rated from uh, Roger, and I'm not going to try the last name because I'll probably get it wrong, but what would it take to synchronize all of the interconnections as an alternative to HVDC? Well, I'll, I'll chime in on that and then pop it back to Bob. Uh, you, you know, 30 years ago when we were asking this same question, we used to make these cartoons where, uh, where we were trying to connect two elephants together with a rubber band, you know, and, and the brakes. So part of the answer to that is, is it's very hard to do in half measure. So you need to have a significant amount of new transmission to tie them together. The first one won't work. Second is we've got a whole bunch of new grid enhancing technologies, including phaser measurement type capabilities that should greatly improve our ability to do that from where we were saying this is hopeless when I was a young engineer. I actually started in this industry, Nick, uh, where the uh, back ends of the elephants came together there in Nebraska. So I'm familiar with that challenge. Um, but Jay Caspery forwarded to me about six months ago, I think it was a study out of uh, Texas A&M, isn't that where Thomas Overby is now, um, where they took a fresh look at essentially connecting the interconnections with AC. And it seems to be kind of doable. I'm not quite sure what it gets you in terms of the 100% clean energy scenario, uh, but it's um, not like it used to be with regard to the uh, technical challenges. So uh, the, the next question I have is a little bit policy and a little bit tech. So let's see what other people have. Um, who should operate a macro grid and what type of market structure would it need? How would you integrate with the underlying parties? And Lauren, because you've got the, the best facial expressions out of anyone on here right now, maybe maybe Allison too, I think I, I might win that, but let's hear what you have to say, Lauren. Who should run this thing? Um, you know, I would hope that the regional transmission operators would take it up and run it if they could. Um, obviously, they'd have to coordinate pretty significantly with each other. Um, as far as the market structures go, that gets pretty darn complicated once you get DC uh, involved. Uh, and I think we, ha we have policy lots of policy work to be done in that area, um, but we have a few years to get that figured out. Over. And this is Allison. I concur. It is 
We have learned a lot since the 2003 blackout about the importance of grid operators working together with common information, common data, common situational awareness, and, and the kinds of grid operational technologies and analytics that are being developed and installed now and in the coming 10 years will make it a lot easier for that kind of effective communication, analytics, and coordination by the time that we actually have substantive transmission between all of these regions and, and RTOs to knit together effectively. So I think that problem can, with the understanding that it will be needed, we have the time to make that work effectively, but it is a solvable problem. So uh, another technical question that we got is, um, they heard us talk about, you know, it's going to take a mix of AC and a mix of DC. How do you try to evaluate those two? How do you consider those trade-offs? When is one better than the other? Bob, take it away. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think we have, we have the understanding of, um, with regard to AC, how much power you can move, how many miles. Um, one of the fundamental problems with, with um, AC, even HVAC, is that you build that new line and the underlying system has to be looked at because you've got to be able to survive that continuously. So when you get to moving very large blocks of power, it gets difficult just to augment the AC system for a long point to point. So that kind of puts you on the HVDC side. And of course, we have a couple of flavors of that, the conventional line commutated converter that probably has the most muscle and then the voltage source converter technologies come a long ways in the last 10 years and would be an option for you know maybe the in-between transfer. It, oh, let me chime in on that too yeah. and, and I'll do my usual thing of reducing this to a cartoon, sorry, All right? So for, for parts of the audience that aren't immersed in this, the issue, HVDC is a great way to move power. So you get more power on my favorite thing, which is use of the right of way, but picking on the highway imagery, interchanges are staggeringly expensive. So you build a section of DC from where the power wants to go in and it goes past everybody's backyard on the way to the place where the power goes out and they get to see the line in their backyard and uh, not be able to get on or off. AC allows you to get on and off. And as Bob said, the contingencies, et cetera, all the secondary roads need to be improved. And societally, you end up with a mix of DC and AC. So move big ass chunks, that's the technical word, <laughs> right? On DC and get the surrounding AC properly built and don't just pretend it's going to be little country roads on the AC. It's both. Awesome. I guess kind of a follow-up question. Um, and this kind of stems from what I heard from Bob. It's like, hey, we actually kind of know how to build transmission, right? I mean, there are other countries doing things like this, right guys? Yes, there are. Another favorite topic, right? I'll hold up the Germans, right? have to have had the same problem and they're building transmission from the windy north to the sunny south. They have land constraints and they have figured out how to build a new transmission line on a right of way while keeping the existing line running. It's awesome. There are technology things that we ain't doing yet and we could. Awesome. Um, another technical question, but I'm gonna field this one about uh... What is it? Rap themed transmission songs. If you guys caught the uh, reference to Sir Mix a Lot, you're welcome. I'm very proud of you. You were a child of the 90s as well. And uh, if anybody wants me to, to invite me to a transmission event, I'll be able to, to sneak one in there for you. But, um, but that was just a little bit of fun because you guys know I do like maps. Uh, okay, another question. We've got another couple minutes here on the tech session about storage and DERs. And despite that our efforts to try to say a lot on DERs or try to say something on it and about storage, maybe we didn't stay enough. Um, does this macro grid obviate the need for, for storage guys and gals? Me, 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 no. You, 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 Allison, take it away. Absolutely not. And, 
And and we we need as much storage and as much distributed generation and as much energy efficiency as possible everywhere we can cram it across the nation, across the continent, across the world. Decarbonization is not just about making the supply cleaner, it's making us all use electricity and energy more efficiently. The challenge of meeting electrification is going to be massive. And everything that we do needs to have efficiency before we do storage, before we do electrification, before we do distributed generation. So we need it all and we need it everywhere because um, you cannot leave the reliability, the grid to the supply side alone, particularly- Allison, I, I wanna challenge you on, on one thing though. You said before- okay. Because we'd be more there is a massive opportunity for employment here and for job creation. And if we can add more people to the industry, it seems like we can do energy efficiency and build storage and build transmission we, all at the same time. We can and we must. And the other thing to remember is that generation and transmission are under the control of large companies, but distributed generation and storage and energy efficiency are very much up to a lot more local and individual decisions. So what we decide to do institutionally on large scale generation storage and transmission will be wholly independent of what us as individuals and as, as local communities are deciding to do. We need it all and we need as much of all of these clean opportunities as possible. You know, I, I, it's one year of lockdown and I still booger up the mute button all the time. Um, we've got a couple more questions that we can take in this session. So I'm going to go through a couple more. Uh, one, Debbie, maybe you can field this one. It's about the extreme weather. I saw a whole bunch of chatter from you with a bunch of meteorologists and climatologists over the weekend. What do we know about the weather and these extreme events? So it's not really clear. I know a lot of people would like to attribute like the recent polar vortex issue in Texas to climate change and saying that accelerating global warming is causing these kinds of things. And it's not clear from at least the meteorologists that um, we've reached out to that that's, that's a true statement um, that you can attribute that. On the other hand, um, we can say that there is going to be more extreme weather events and that um, more extreme, for example, heat waves like what happened in California last year when we had the rolling blackouts in California and the, the um, heat waves going up and down the West Coast being more widespread. We can say that those kinds of things um, are going to be happening more with climate change. So um, there's, we've got to be really careful. We've got to look to the meteorologists to figure out exactly um, what's attributable and what's not. But if there are going to be more extreme temperature events, especially extreme extended heat waves, I think the, that just drives more ammunition to wanting to have larger transmission interconnection across the country so that you can get to, like Bob says, your neighbor's neighbor, right? It's no longer just about reaching out to your neighbors. You're going to want to reach out farther than that. I think that neighbor comment is so important. And as I scrolled through the Slido, we saw a lot of other neighbors that we might not think of as so close. So we see examples from Europe in the comments from ENTSO that has been working on coordinated planning for a very long time. And if you haven't gone to look there, go look at those recommendations. I see another question, which I don't know. I wonder if somebody fed this one. Is there a transatlantic platform for ISOs and operators to collaborate on lessons learned? And yes, there is. It is the Global Power Systems Transformation, GPST. It's a major initiative, international, covers all the continents. Well, maybe not Antarctica. Um, and so there's a lot of participation for people to try to share lessons and, and figure out how we can get there together. So if you haven't seen recent events from GPST at ESIG, um, you can go ahead and Google them and see the examples. And so, so glad to see the international participation, whether it's our, our friends in Belgium or in the UK sharing their lessons here. ESIG is an international organization and bringing those, those stories to bear and facilitating that conversation is so helpful. And Ryan Willis coming in hot with the GPST link in the comments, 
make sure you follow up um, and click on that and go learn a little bit more and offer your own collaboration and experiences there. So um, that takes us to the, to the end of this topic. Why don't we go ahead and flip over to policy? And um, so Allison, Lauren, I hear cost allocation in the corners. What do we think about those <laughs> topics? So as you may or may not know, I led the cost allocation process um, at MISO that resulted in the multi-value projects. And a couple of things, number one, it's really hard, um, but you can do it. Uh, and for the MVPs, I just wanna uh, call out to MISO because what they did do was much like um, Aaron described uh, with the CRES, they identified, each state identified a renewal renewable energy zone first, then they developed the transmission from that. And then we went into the cost allocation to figure out how we were gonna pay for the 17 multi-value projects. And um, one of the key issues, because we, the regulators led that process at MISO. Um, and one of the key issues was the regulators had to have a meeting in the minds with regards to the need for more renewables and the need for more transmission. And they knew if they didn't lead, somebody else was gonna lead. And that prompted the regulators to step up and go work, literally we worked for 18 months to come up with the cost allocation that resulted in the MVPs. So uh, again, baseline um, facts that you agree on um, and recognizing that the train is leaving the station, either you're gonna be in the engine, in the, uh, in the engine room or you're gonna be in the caboose, thanks. I was thinking you'd be on the tracks, <laughs> which, which leads to a higher point about cost allocation for transmission. We all know that electric reliability and decarbonization are public goods. And this is why it is so important for national and international policy and for national leadership and coordination and policy setting to be leading this consideration and resolution of this set of issues rather than us leaving it to the um, goodwill and good intentions of a transient set of, of, of state commissioners or governors who have to respond to local and parochial interests that are not always consistent with the good of the nation and the needs of the nation as a whole. We know that not every state is going to get their own piece of the macro grid, but every state will, will realize some of the benefits of decarbonization and of better reliability and broader distribution of renewables, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need a, I, I, I know the idea of referring to reasoned public policy in the context of recent political events is maybe a misnomer, but we need a sensible set of policies and guidance set by others about how to allocate costs, understanding that everybody's gonna get benefits even if they don't have the transmission line dropping transmission right outside their door. So this, this is a, a certainly not an easy challenge, but we don't have any current policy or laws or you know the Federal Power Act doesn't say how to do this and no state statutes say how to do it either. So it is new territory, but absolutely necessary to, to resolve. Awesome, thank you so much. So uh, one other topic that I heard from both of you during these sessions and we heard from our collaborators during the five events was the importance of national leadership and, and maybe even presidential leadership. And we saw some comments about how are we getting this in front of the policymakers? What do we as engineers, what are we capable of doing to bring this to, to, to others' attention? Well, President Biden has already made climate change and responding to climate change one of his key initiatives. And so we, we don't need to get the president's attention, the president's, president's goals got our attention. Uh, and what I would say is, you know, we do need presidential leadership on this. And uh, I would just ask you to imagine this situation where the president calls in all of the CEOs of the RTOs, ISOs, and uh, the other planning authorities into a room and says, this is what we need to do, figure it out. Over. 
Well, and and the governors of those states that are not fortunate enough to be already organized into ISOs and RTOs. Understood. I put the planning authority, the other planning authorities in that. It could be the governors, it could be the other planning authorities, but all of the states need to be represented. So what are some of the other policy topics that came up in all of our, our discussions? Um, we heard here, we see one comment coming in, inform the legislators too. Yes, we've got to let them know. So, so take our report, hopefully it's useful. We're going to have the webinar up online. We're going to have the slide deck that we provided up online so that you have content that you can bring with you elsewhere. Collaborate back, shoot us emails and let us know what you think. But I mean, can anybody else comment on the line? What were the other policy considerations that people brought up? One of the most important issues here to be made clear is transmission and grid reliability are about jobs and they're about economic well-being and they're about human health and safety as the past week in Texas has painfully demonstrated and about economic well-being and they should not be the subject of partisan pissing and moaning and positions. This is too important for cheap shots and cheap ill-considered decision positions. So really this is about an endeavor that can make the country richer, stronger and safer and healthier for decades to come with an awful lot of employment and an awful lot of security and an awful lot of money and comfort floating around. And if we pass this up, life is gonna be a lot more expensive and a lot more mm -hmm. uncomfortable than if we don't seize this opportunity to go big and, and to do meaningful changes to our nation's transmission and electric infrastructure. Agreed, and I would just point out, uh, we also talked about the role of FERC and DOE in this initiative, and it's it, they're gonna be critical agencies um, no matter who does this. So uh, FERC has powers to require interregional um, Transmission planning, which they included in Order 1000, but uh, based on a recent, recent convening of um, for chairs, I think everybody agreed that uh, insufficient um, action has been taken on those inter interregional plans. So I think FERC can do a lot to get us um, get us along in a mi mi macro grid, and uh, with DOE's help, it, it can be a one-two punch. Thank you. Over. Yeah, just one quick. Uh, in defense of the nerds of the universe here. And that is, uh, you know, DOE and, and the research community that I consider myself a part of are important. Uh, but the other community is there is an astonishing amount of technical competence and depth in the ISOs, in the RTOs. There's a lot of engineering skill out there that knows what needs to be done and they need to be given the, the purview, the air cover, the tools to go out and, and do what needs to be done to their grids. Every, every operating system in the country has got an astonishing reservoir of expertise that is frequently got their hands tied behind their backs by policy. Um, okay. And the, the, actually, the ultimate problem is we've spent a decade admiring this problem and it's time to stop admiring it and start doing something about it. I, I think that is a just a great way to, to wrap us up. So um, and, and I, I wanna thank everybody so much for participating, for spending the hour and a half. I saw over 400 participants online caring about national transmission planning to some level, at least enough to show up. So I think that's just so wonderful. If you'd like to come up to the virtual podium and, and carry on the conversation for 10 minutes or so, keep your camera on, unclick mute and have a conversation with us. We're gonna have breakout rooms that are gonna pop up. You can go in there, wave hello, throw a tomato, whatever you guys wanna do, but go ahead and try to, to join us in those breakout rooms. We'll see how we can do it. I'm trying to extend the experience beyond just you know sitting in front of your screen. So uh, thank you to all of our, our facilitators on this call today, Jay Casperi, as well as all the other co-facilitators, Bob Simonelli and everybody else. So thank you so much. I couldn't appreciate it uh, enough. Couldn't thank you enough. And uh, why don't we go ahead and, and jump into those breakout rooms and, and see if there's any conversation to carry on. Thanks again, everyone. Uh, to be clear, you click that little more button and you see the, the breakout rooms and you can choose technical or policy. I'll see you in the policy room. <laughs>